going into this lesson, I, uh, I really knew nothing about Moody. I had obviously heard the name. I think we've all heard of Moody Bible Institute, but I really didn't know anything about him past that. And I thought, oh, hey, Moody, that's cool. Two of my sister-in-law sister go to school there. Yay, that'll be exciting. Um, but as I dug into it, what I found is some things that just really blew me away about Moody. And there's three things that stood out to me and things that I'm going to try and uh, kind of bring out in the lesson tonight about Moody, things that we could all definitely strive for. And, you know, I didn't, uh, didn't put them in my notes, but I want you to jot these down on the side just as an opening. Three things about Moody. First and foremost, Moody was humble. Okay? Moody came from nothing. He had virtually no education. And he went on to do incredible things, but throughout his entire life, he was humble. Anytime was, he was introduced as the Reverend Moody, he would promptly correct them and say, no, 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 I am just your brother Moody, just Mr. Moody. Never wanted to be uh, lifted up or exalted or talked highly about. He, he was, I am Mr. Moody, and I'm just here to teach and to learn and, and so on and so forth. Secondly, Moody had a passion for learning. So here was a man that, you know, as, we're, as we dig into this, we're going to find out he had a fifth grade education, no theological education whatsoever, but he had a passion for learning. Uh, it was said that he would often, uh, when other preachers would come in to, to preach in his church, afterwards he would kind of gather them around and say, okay, guys, and he'd open up his Bible and say, explain this passage to me, and, and what about this, and answer this question for me, and he would start picking their brains, and he would tell them, I've gathered you all here today so that I can get knowledge from you, which I can then give in my sermons. Uh, another little anecdote was that uh, somebody came to preach in his church, a, a professor of theology, and after Moody introduced him, Moody promptly grabbed his chair off the stage, walked down, set it down in, on the floor right in front of the pulpit, sat down in it, and opened up his Bible, ready to learn. And as this professor began to speak and began to teach, uh, Moody, in the middle of the sermon, exclaimed, well, there goes one of my sermons. The preacher said, oh, hold on, Mr. Moody, what are you talking about? He said, oh, you just completely threw, uh, uh, refuted something that I, I had been teaching. I've been teaching it wrong, so you just, I just had to throw the sermon out. Uh, and then throughout the sermon, it said about a dozen more times, as this preacher would teach and, and preach, Moody would say, oh, there goes another one. Oh, there goes another one. Oh, got to throw that one out too. Humble and dedicated to learning, willing to say, oh, hey, I was wrong, and then go and correct himself and take this knowledge in. And lastly, and most importantly, Moody had an absolute passion for souls. Okay? When he first arrived in church with virtually no education whatsoever, one of the very first things that he did after joining the church and learning a bit was he said, I want to teach Sunday school. And he began to seek out people to say, come, let me teach you. Okay? He was just passionate about souls. And his entire life, uh, as we're going to see, is just devoted to the winning of souls, to finding people and, and bringing them to Christ. Okay? So uh, we can get started here. Let's see. I'm new to the clicker thing. so uh, I've tried to, in my PowerPoints, kind of underline the things to fill in. Uh, if I miss anything, just you know, throw something at me or yell at me, and I'll try and figure out where I left off. The junior hires know I have a tendency to go off on tangents, so I apologize in advance. Uh, Dwight Moody, uh, he was born February 5th in uh, 1837, and he lived in Northfield, Massachusetts. He was, very, he was the youngest of six, um, came from a poor family. They, they really didn't have much. At 17, he left home uh, basically to go get a job, uh, worked as a shoe salesman. Uh, he went to work for his uncle. Yeah, let's see. Oh, Okay. He went to work as a shoe salesman for his uncle, and his uncle required him, as a part of the terms of his, ed of his employment, to attend church every Sunday, and I don't have the blank up here, but uh, in the handout it says, who required him to attend church, and in parentheses it said, to keep him from mischief. Now, with modern-day labor laws, uh, if your boss told you you have to go to church in order to keep your job, I think we'd have a bunch of lawsuits on our hands. But back in the 1800s, that was a perfectly reasonable thing, and, and his uncle probably had no concept whatsoever of what he was starting. But he said, listen, Dwight, you've got to go to church just to keep you out of trouble if you're going to work for me, and uh, look what it started. So keep in mind, folks... Even the littlest things that we do when we encourage other people, when we say, come to church with me, we have no idea the impact that we're going to have. D.L. Moody's uncle had no idea what he was doing by forcing Dwight to go to church. 
Um, we have no idea the impact that we can have on people around us, even with just the simplest of things. Okay. Now, when Moody, uh, he started going to church, um, early on, he asked to join the church. And at that time, in order to join the church, they, you know, a lot of churches had catechisms. Um, they had different uh, classes that you uh, had to attend, similar to what we have, but probably a little more in depth. And he wasn't able to answer a lot of the questions that they asked. And in fact, one of the, uh, one of the officers of the church told him, young man, you can serve the Lord better by keeping still. Okay, so for all of you out there who are like me and have ADHD, we would not have made it in any sort of church. Okay, we would have promptly been booted out the door. Okay, uh, think about the things that we say to the people around us, just like Dwight's uncle and how, how we can have a positive impact. Think about the things we say when we discourage others and say, am I we're drawing people closer to God or am I pushing them away? Okay. A lot of times in churches, we can get puffed up in ourselves. We can start saying, oh, I'm so solemn, and I don't want these disruptive people in our church. But that is not the church that Jesus Christ wanted. That's not the church that Jesus you know, founded here on earth. And Dwight, fortunately, D.L. Moody was not one to, to be told no. So even though he told, they told him that he would be better off uh, keeping still, uh, he went on, learned the things that he needed to learn, was able to join the church, and shortly thereafter, uh, let's see. We'll get to that, sorry. <laughs> uh, in 1856, moved to Chicago, uh, became a very active member of the YMCA, and this was at the time when the YMCA actually meant, or actually stood for the things that it that its name implies. So it's the Young Men's Christian Association. Today it's commonly known for having a, a gym and you know basketball courts and place to hang out. Uh, but back then this was a place run by Christians dedicated to reaching young men for the Lord, giving them a place to stay and a place to get an education in Christ. Dwight became very involved with that Willing to do just about anything, he often took on janitorial duties. He was an unpaid volunteer, but he was so dedicated, he said, listen, I'll, I'll do anything. I'll empty your trash cans. I'll clean your toilets. I just want to be a part of this. That was how his passions lied. Um, during this time, uh, he approached his Sunday school superintendent because he wanted to become a teacher. Now, understand, Dwight was not... Uh, you know, years and years of being in the church. He was still very young in Christ, but his passion was already starting to grow, and he realized that outside those doors, there was a whole world that was absolutely lost, and he needed to do something about it. So he wanted to start out as a Sunday school teacher, and the superintendent told him, Dwight, you know, this is wonderful. I appreciate your, uh, your enthusiasm. However, right now, our student-to-teacher ratio is about one-to-one. -one. So how many people want to be in my Sunday school class as the only student having to listen to me? And I noticed none of my junior high students raised their hand. Okay. <laughs> Moody, and again, not one to be told no, decided, okay, well, I'll go find my own students. Uh, within less than a year, his class went from uh, no students whatsoever to over 1,000. And he took a rather, rather unconventional approach. Oh, let me... Uh, there we go. Took a rather unconventional approach. At this time, a lot of people, you were, you were born into church, you went to church, and if you weren't a church person, well, that was it. You know, you didn't, there wasn't a lot of evangelism, especially in urban environments. The mission field, a lot of times it was dedicated to going to, you know, the cannibals and the barbarians, and we'll reach, you know, the, the deepest parts of the earth, but they would forget about their own towns, their own cities. Uh, Moody realized that his mission field was directly outside his door. And so he began to go into the Chicago slums and he began to uh, recruit the, the uneducated, the poor, the needy, the ones who had nothing, the ones who were ignored by the church. And we can see a parallel here to Jesus' ministry, how Jesus went to the, the people that the religious rejected. Moody did the exact same thing. Okay. So a lot of times we start thinking, God, show me where, what I can do and how I can serve you. I'll go to Africa. And he's saying, go to your neighbor. And how many of us are guilty of the exact same thing that so many others do? And say, no, no, I want to do great things. And God's saying, no, start with the small things. Moody in his humility was willing to say, you know what? I'll go to the dirty. I'll go to the unwashed masses. I'll go get these boys off the street who are completely undisciplined. And I will bring them in. And he actually brought them into a converted saloon, okay? 
It's amazing what God can do. A place of drinking, a place of sin, later became a place of Christ, a place where people were taught, where souls were changed, where lives were changed and souls were saved. Okay? He earned the nickname at this time of Crazy Moody. Okay? The, ch- the church elite, they didn't care for his style. Uh, he was a little too uh, ambitious, a little too, uh, well, you know, they told him to keep still and he didn't. Uh, he went and he got the poor kids, the kids that probably smelled bad. Um, they didn't like him. He was crazy moody, kind of set apart. He was off in a slum. They didn't want a lot to do with him. Um, but a visit and a commendation from Abraham Lincoln actually changed the opinion of him. Uh, Lincoln heard about what he was doing and in a visit to Chicago, actually came and met with Moody, saw what he was doing and commended him, saying, you need to keep this up, okay? Lincoln understood. Lincoln came from nothing. He was very similar to Moody. Came from nothing, no education. He understood the value of reaching the people that otherwise were forgotten. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, I'm going to back up. Didn't mean to show you that yet. In June of uh, 1860, um, Moody visited the entire class of a dying Sunday school teacher. So one of his fellow teachers was passing away. And during this time, he went and he visited each of the students involved in this class, went into their home, saw how they lived, met them. And what this started to do was develop in him a love for people, not just a passion for their souls, but a love for the people themselves. And if we look at our own lives, what happens if we meet somebody on the street and we say, hey, you know, uh, God loves you and, and I, I hope you come to church someday, but we, we don't actually take the time to get to know them and love them. Is our ministry really effective? Not really. You know, it's like uh, the Bible talks about how if you give a man uh, uh, a little bit of food, you might feed him for a day, but what if, you know, if he loses his soul, what's it worth? Moody began to develop a love and see past just the winning of the soul, but to, to actually meet these people, to get to know them, to love everyone around him, okay? From visiting and sharing the gospel with each of his pupils, it says Moody developed the strongest impulse for trying to bring uh, souls to Christ. Okay? Just an absolute passion burning in him for reaching those who are, who are lost. Um, fast forward a little bit to about 1860. Uh, at this point, Moody had been very successful as a shoe salesman. Um, he had saved up, uh, said he had saved up about $7,000. Uh, personally, if I had $7,000, I'd be ecstatic, and that's in today's money. If we go back to the 1860s, we adjust for inflation, that was actually quite a bit of money, okay? So he was obviously very good at what he did, uh, saved up a lot of money, and it gave him an opportunity to step away from the business world and to devote himself full-time to working with the YMCA, to ministering to those who were lost, dedicate himself to teaching Sunday school, um, Around this time, he met a young lady, pretty young lady, at least I'm guessing, uh, a nice young lady by the name of Emma Ravel. Uh, they were married in 1862. Um, the book that I was reading said, you may recognize the Ravel name, and I thought, no, I have no idea what that name is. Uh, but apparently, Emma's brother Fleming uh, was the founder of the Christian publishing group uh, Ravel Publishing, uh, which was the publishing house that then published all of Moody's writings and all of his uh, future ministry partner, Ira Sankey's songbooks. So this was, you know, it was kind of cool how God worked this way by bringing these people together. Moody, uh, with his preaching, his uh, ministry partner that we'll talk about in a few minutes, Ira Sankey, and his singing and the songbooks, and then having a publisher who can then publish these things, distribute them. Um, it's just really cool how God brings these people together in our lives, and we never know who we're going to meet and uh, who we're going to run into. Uh, let's see, where did I lose my place at? All right, 1861. All right. 1861, we're about the time of the Civil War at this point. If we, if we remember our history, I know the students here on summer break, you don't want to think about history, but this was about the time of the Civil War. Uh, Moody had a, a burden for the soldiers that were uh, stationed in Camp Douglas, which was near Chicago. And this was, at the time, it was uh, Union soldiers. But throughout the next four years, 
uh, as he started ministries to that camp, he then started traveling throughout the country and actually traveling into the South, ministering to Confederate soldiers, uh, actually was on some of the front lines with soldiers going from side to side in between the battles, trying to save, you know, bring these guys to the Christ saying, you know, you are fighting, you're, you're going to go out tomorrow and stand in lines and shoot each other. Please give your lives to Christ before you go and die. And, uh, said that he was, uh, after the fall of Richmond, Virginia, and uh, the battle there, he was one of the first people to enter Virginia after that battle and went in immediately trying to spread the gospel and, and just meet the needs of the people there in, in the wake of this battle that was going on, or that had just finished up. Uh, during Moody's ministry, he made multiple trips to Britain, over to the United Kingdom, uh, at the time, he wasn't very well known here in the States. He, few people had heard of him, but it wasn't until he started going to Britain that his, his fame actually kind of grew over there, or grew worldwide. Britain, I don't want to say they kick-started his, uh, his career, but uh, had a big influence on you know, making him kind of a household name at the time. Um, 1867, let's see, he visited Britain. Uh, he attended, uh, where is it? Let me look at my other notes. He attended the Metropolitan Tabernacle, and if you were here a few weeks ago and got to hear Jamie speak about Spurgeon, uh, we're familiar with the Metropolitan Tabernacle. He, he attended there and was able to hear Spurgeon preach. And if you think about, you know, after hearing about Spurgeon and having read about him, to be able to go in there and hear the, the power of Spurgeon's messages and to just experience that, experience that would have been phenomenal. And Moody felt a kind of a kinship with Spurgeon because like Moody, Spurgeon was rather uneducated. You know, if you remember, Jamie, you were saying he was kind of rough in his speech. Um, a lot of parallels there. Moody identified with him and said, okay, if this is a man who can stand up in the Metropolitan Tabernacle, who can command audiences like this and who can reach souls for Christ, there's nothing I can't do because I've got just the same qualifications he does. Uh, let's see, during that time, uh, he also met with John Nelson Darby and George Mueller, who were uh, some of the founders and uh, some, had accomplished some very great things over in Britain. But one of the most influential people that he met with while he was there was uh, a man by the ha uh, name of Harry Morehouse. And he was a former prize fighter and an outspoken evangelist. Now, if you're not familiar with the term prize fighter, uh, that would be the equivalent of today's MMA fighters. Okay? He was a boxer, got in a ring and just pummeled people. Uh, he had done that for many years, uh, had lived a life of very great sin, it said, uh, you know, drinking, just all, everything that sin had to offer, and then became converted to Christ and became an outspan, outspoken evangelist, um, very willing to speak to anybody, anywhere, anytime, that kind of um, took all, the, all of the, the passion that he would have brought to the fighting ring and instead brought it to the case of Christ, okay? And he, uh, he was one to point some things out to Moody. Um, Moody at that point had been teaching quite a bit using his own words. He'd read a little bit, think that he understood something, and then get up and preach it. Um, but when he spoke with Henry Moore, or Harry Morehouse, I'm sorry, uh, Harry showed him the importance of using God's words and not his own. Rather than relying on his own interpretations, on his own understanding, he said, you need to dig deeper into the gospel. Okay? You need to trace through the great themes of scripture. Uh, at that point, he told Moody, go out and buy a concordance. If you're not familiar with what a concordance is, uh, it's, it basically defines every word that's in the Bible. It gives a definition where that word is found, every verse that it's found in. My mom had one that was about this thick. It probably weighed about 20 pounds. Um, every now and then she would toss it at me when she was mad at me and say, look up a word. And, and after it knocked me down, I would pick it up and look up words. And, um, side note, uh, one time I got in trouble and so she made me look up every reference of the word no in the Bible and write out every verse. Uh, so if you can think about it, a concordance is just a 
massive volume of information. And so Moody went and got one of those and immediately it said that it changed that the way he preached because he was no longer relying on his own interpretation, his own understanding, but he was going through the scripture, understanding these words, and then being able to preach the gospel and not just his version of the gospel. Around about 19, or I'm sorry, 19, around about 1870, uh, Moody took a trip to Indianapolis, and while he was there, he met a man by the name of Ira Sankey. Uh, if you've ever sang a lot of the old hymns, I know I grew up in a church where we, had, you know, we went with the old, old th hymns, you'll see the name Ira Sankey quite a bit. Uh, he was an organ player and a singer. And at this point, there wasn't a lot of music in churches, okay? Uh, if there was music, it was typically people getting up, everybody standing up and very solemnly and monotonely singing psalms, like literally the psalms from the Bible. Just, you know, he leads me by still waters. Just very uplifting stuff, you know, sort of thing that really gets the blood pumping. Uh, the stuff that we had going on tonight with the, the, our, uh, our worship team, uh, we would have been thrown out of the church and probably branded as heretics at that point. So... Moody hears Sankey playing the organ and singing and promptly starts trying to recruit him for ministry, saying, this is amazing, you, you have a great voice, you have a, a great talent, and we need to use this for the Lord. It says it took him about six months to convince Sankey to leave his, uh, his career and go out on the road with him and become a ministry partner. But from that point on, anytime you talk about Moody, it's Moody and Sankey. The two of them joined at the hip, just ministry partners, kind of Paul and Silas, that sort of thing, just joined together in ministry together as one. Oops. 1871, though, we see another turning point in Moody's ministry. Okay, We see a few just major points in his ministry. One is when he met Harry Morehouse. It changed the way that he preached. But in uh, 1871, many of us are familiar with the, the Chicago Fire. Uh, legend has it that, uh, oh, I forget the name of the lady, but her cow kicked over a lantern while it was being milked and caught some hay on fire. Did somebody say the name in the back? Oh, well, anyway, it doesn't matter. Mrs. O'Leary, that's right. Blame the Irish. Um, I'm Irish, so I can say that, right? Mrs. O'Leary's cow kicked over a lantern. It caught some hay on fire, promptly burned down uh, a one-mile by four-mile stretch of uh, Chicago, uh, they say the damage, I think I've got it on here, yeah. 300 people died, thousands of buildings burned, and in 1870 money, $200 million worth of damage and loss. Uh, so you can only imagine what that would be in today's dollars. Uh, absolute tragedy. The night that that happened, Moody was preaching, and he concluded his service by saying to his congregation, I want you to go home tonight, and I want you to consider Christ and come back next Sunday and tell me what you've decided. They walked out the doors and, and we don't know how many of the people in his congregation died that night. Hold on a second. Something that's just been impressed on me. Um, sorry. We don't have time, guys. We think we do, okay, but we don't. We don't know what's going to happen when we walk out the door. And if I'm just, you know, choked up just saying that, think about what happened to Moody when this happened to his own congregation. He said he was destroyed for a week. He, he wouldn't eat. He wouldn't talk. He wouldn't leave his room. He was just absolutely floored. After that, he vowed that... Whoops. Oh, okay. He vowed that he would never let a sermon <clears throat> end without a call to Christ. And that's a blank that uh, you guys need to fill in that I forgot to put up in here. But think about this, guys. We do not know what tomorrow brings. We don't know what an hour from now brings. Okay, when we're done here, we're all going to walk out the door. We'll probably chit-chat for a while. And then we're all going to get in our cars, and we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what's going to happen next week. We don't know what's going to happen next year. And the reality is we don't have time. Okay? If we look at the events of the world and we look at the Bible and what it says about the end times, Christ could return any moment. The trumpet could sound right now. 
and it'd be over, and we're out of time. Think of the souls that we're going to leave behind. If that doesn't get a fire burning in you, I don't know what will. Okay. Certainly lit a fire in Moody. <clears throat> Let's move on to other things so I can be less choked up. 1872 and 1873, Moody returned to Britain, uh, essentially crusades to Britain. Um, He visited England, Ireland, and Scotland. And if you remember, a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the early missionaries had come out of this very area. But at the time, the UK was just kind of falling into a, a state of not necessarily godlessness, but almost apathy. This was about the time that Darwin was becoming very popular. Uh, and church leaders were coming right out and saying, <laughs> Darwin's a problem. And when Moody showed up, this church was similar to a lot of churches he'd already been to where they didn't really like him. And one preacher was even uh, quoted as saying to the effect of, I'll take Moody over Darwin. At least he's trying to save souls. So not exactly high praise, but if you think about it, that's the state that, that England and Ireland and Scotland were in where they were like, well, okay, we'll take this crazy evangelist from the U.S. At least he's not Darwin. But Moody and Sankey coming there kind of stirred things up. There was a little bit of a revival starting to, starting to stir, and they poured some fuel on this fire. Sankey, through his music, even though uh, the thought of organ music probably doesn't excite us, it was something completely different to them. They hadn't experienced this before, and it, it caught people's attention. And then Moody would get up and speak, and they said, the first few nights, nobody showed up. It was practically an empty house. But within a few days, as the word spread, they were, having, they were packing out 5,000-seat auditoriums and having to do multiple meetings because so many people were coming to say, who is this guy? What is he saying? He's saying something we haven't heard before. Obviously, when you start doing things like that, however, you start kind of stirring the pot. And there were a lot of the hardline ministers of the time, a lot of the, essentially, the Pharisees of this place that didn't really like it. Uh, one of them was quoted as, as coming to Moody and saying, uh, when you're done preaching, make sure you send all of my rightful con converts to me. Okay, you know, just when you're done with them, send them back to my church for me. Here, you go do the work and then let me reap the benefit. They didn't really care for him, but the people loved it and the people just came in droves. And this started, this kind of ignited a revival in England at the time. Uh, they were able to travel into Scotland and Ireland. And if you know anything about... Scotland, or Ireland in particular, they went to both northern and southern Ireland. Uh, there's a very, very strong Protestant and Catholic divide in this country, and Moody was able to, in a lot of cases, bridge that divide. Okay. One of the things that he, he did that was very different at the time was Moody eschewed, it's a big word, denomination. Anybody here know what eschew means? He's trying to pick a fancy word. Denounced, yeah, he, had, he, he wasn't interested in denominations. He didn't care if you were Baptist or Lutheran or Methodist. What he cared about and what we should care about is not the title, but the word of God. And when he stood up in front of an audience, he spoke from the word of God. There was no denominational politics. There was no, uh, well, we believe this and we believe that. It was, this is what the Bible says. A lot of times we get caught up in that, even in this very day and age. I've been caught up in these things myself about, well, we're Baptist and, you know, you're Methodist. And at the core of it, it's about the gospel. At the end of the day, are we Baptists? No, we're Christians. We are called to serve God. We are called to study his word. And it really doesn't matter the denomination. And this was Moody's message. And he was bringing people in from all different groups, all different walks of life, and presenting them with the gospel. Uh, during his time in Scotland, uh, this was a, just a kind of a funny note. Um, they were very unused to, or very not used to music. Um, and uh, at one point they were, they were having some meetings and it was so full that they had a meeting in, in one building where Sankey started out, he'd play the organ and he would sing. And in the meantime, Moody would be across the street in another building Teach, or preaching, and there was, you know, they were both packed. And then once they were both done, they would switch, go across the street, and, and do the opposite. You know? 
And apparently one Scottish lady was very upset about the fact that Sankey was playing music in a church, stood up in the middle of it, said, let me out, let me out. What would John Knox think of the likes of you? She ran out the door, crossed the street to Moody's building, sat down, listened to Moody's sermon, was very happy. And then when they switched and Sankey showed up and started playing, she promptly freaked out again, said, let me out, let me out. What would John Knox think of you? And ran out the door. I thought that was amusing. I told Jenna, she was like, so? <laughs> All right, well, we find different things funny, but. <laughs> Moody's later life, uh, years and years of touring, I guess touring isn't really the word, but going to different places, preaching, teaching, up and down the Atlantic seaboard, all the major cities along the Atlantic coast, England multiple times, the United Kingdom multiple times. Um, numerous tours and preaching engagements. He was constantly on the go. Um, just had a, an absolute burden for reaching people, going anywhere he could go, any place that would have him, speaking any time that he could. He also had a burden for uh, making sure that people had opportunities to learn. You know, he understood, because he came from a background of, of no education, he understood the value of providing people with an education. And one of the things that his wife was passionate about was particularly reaching young women. You know, if we look back on, the, historically, women did not have a lot of rights. They didn't have a lot of opportunities in these times. Um, we've come a long way since then. But back then, a lot of times women, you know, they'd go get a few years of education and then they'd get married and have children. That, that was their life. Moody's wife, Emma, she wanted better. And so over time, she and Moody, you know, they during talks, discussions, their passions aligned. Moody uh, eventually opened up the, uh, the Northfield Cemetery, Seminary, Cemetery, <laughs> Seminary for young women. And it was geared specific, it was a, a theological school for women. That was unheard of at the time. You know, nowadays, if a, a young lady wants to go to a, a Bible school, they're like, yeah, absolutely, whatever. It's not even a big deal. But at that point in time, there was nothing, nothing like this for women. So he opened up this seminary as an opportunity for women to come and get both educational and spiritual training. And then he also, uh, uh, it's not on here, but he, uh, he also opened the Mount Hernan School for Boys very shortly after. And this was another one that was geared towards the poor, the underprivileged, uh, you know, just basically anybody who needed an education could come and get an education here. Um, let's see, 1886. He founded uh, the Chicago Evangelization Society uh, that we now commonly know as uh, the Moody Bible Institute. Uh, it was named that after he died. Um, they speculate that he would have never allowed it if he had known about it. Um, but he was focused and passionate about providing education for people, uh, both spiritually, uh, well, just educationally and spiritually. Um, and meeting the needs of, of anybody who needed it. And uh, if you know much about Moody Bible Institute, uh, there is no tuition cost for the Moody Bible Institute today. Now, you do have to pay for your room and board, and it's not exactly cheap, but for students that want to go to Moody Bible Institute, the alumni pay for that because they value and they understand the same things that Moody understood and valued about, the, about education and saying, let's just get people here and teach them and give them these opportunities. Moody is quoted as saying one of his famous quotes is, I go where I can, or where I can do the most good. That is what I'm after. It is souls I want. It is souls I want. And that was his driving passion throughout his entire life and his ministry. It was meeting the needs of people, leading them to Christ, saving their souls. Okay? I want to issue a challenge to, to myself just as much as, as the rest of you. How many of us can say, that's what we want? And then if we say it, how many, of us, how many of us can actually back it up with our word or with our actions? It's easy to say, I want to save souls, but how many of us have this sort of passion in us and the willingness to go out and do the way that Dwight Moody did? Okay. So that's my challenge to, again, to myself just as much as you. Where is our passion? Is it for souls? 
Are we taking that sort of action? Are we willing to meet? Are we willing to go to our neighbor? Are we willing to go to the poor, the unwanted, the people that everybody else ignores like he did? Or are we too busy trying to contemplate the great things that we could do for God? Lord, the truth is, is that behind each of these world-changing individuals, we find men and women who knew how to pray. Lord, there is no way that we will make an eternal difference without prayer. Lord, even, even Moody, he understood what it was to be a man of prayer. Lord, I pray that we will draw near to you. As we have listened to the presentation tonight, Lord, and reminded of the Chicago fire and that call that Moody gave to, to think about this, think about the gospel and from his mouth came almost a permission in his own mind that you'll have a week. And that's what really stuck him so deeply is that he couldn't tell people, come back in a week. And so, Father, as we have gathered this evening and we have heard of men that you saved, including D.L. Moody, there may be one or two or more here tonight and they, have, they don't know you. The thought of death scares them. So, Father, I pray that the gospel would, uh, would arrest their hearts with the truth that Jesus Christ lived a sinless life and died in the place of sinners, was buried and rose again so that we can be forgiven and if there is someone here tonight, Lord, who's struggling, they don't know you, that maybe tonight would be the night when they repent of their sin and trust in you. Father, help us to be clear, your children here that know you, on repentance and faith. Those are the two essential elements when we're sharing the gospel. Repentance, turning from sin, and faith, placing one's faith in Christ alone. We must understand that and we must share that. So you promise to go with us. Enable us to do that, Lord. And may we be bold. I think about that close, closing line that James put up that, that Moody vowed he would go wherever he could have the most impact. So, Father, let us be wise as believers with our time, with our days, with our resources to make the greatest impact that we can make with the one life you have given to us. Bless your church, Lord. Bless the information that's going to go out, the gospel that's going to go out. Use us to make a difference in our community and in this world. We love you. We thank you for your great salvation. We thank you for the, the history, the testimonies of many who have come before. Let us, Lord, live for such a time as this. Let us be used by you in your hand in a mighty way tonight and tomorrow and every day after that you give to us. And we'll give you the praise and we'll give you the glory. And all the people said, amen.